Um, I, I worked on a project um, with the Western Cape government, specifically the Department of Human Settlements, to uh, develop a proposal to update their current norms and standards for improved building efficiency. Um, or, and it was termed, actually, what was really interesting was that this comes out of a project I did in 2016, where um, the focus was on green procurement for state subsidized housing. So what are the, within the procurement system, within the supply chain management system, what can be done to improve the environmental and financial um, kind of legacy of these large scale human settlement projects that the South African government, and then in this case, the Western Cape government implements. So you often have housing projects of, of over a thousand units at a time being rolled out. Okay, <laughs> so, um, just uh, quickly, uh, this is also based in the idea that the of rising electricity costs and what sort of um, operational burden are you leaving with the beneficiaries who receive a house for free but are then responsible for costs associated with um, the house in operations and maintenance. The houses cost the the subsidies incredibly. Um, uh, constrained in South Africa, and the houses in total with services and everything cost about 200 to 220,000 rand per top structure. Um, the actual top structure itself, you get 110,000 rand for the top structure. Okay, so that's a kind of, we're really, we're really working in the lowest bracket of state subsidized housing. When It's called the breaking new ground model, and it's not um, high density affordable housing, such as the social housing, or as we call it in South Africa, which is rental units. Um, okay, so that's a very constrained market that we're working in. Um, but we also then in the Western Cape are dealing with the kind of long-term issues around drought and water security. And this actually severely impacted construction projects and the delivery of housing projects because of the water that was needed to input in the construction process. So that was an interesting knock-on effect that wasn't fully thought of prior to the drought um, really hitting. And then of course, landfills are the next um, huge situation that many municipalities are faced with in terms of waste management is very expensive and um, they're filling up and building and construction material takes up an unnecessary amount of landfill airspace in many of these municipalities. So, how do we use the procurement of state subsidized housing to address these issues? Okay, the Western Cape just very quickly also has um, various strategic goals. These are now being updated with the new administration that was recently voted in. But what you can see is that they have, uh, at basically the story here is that at a strategic level within the organization, they support sustainable and resilient infrastructure and human settlements. And going hand in hand with that, of course, is always job creation. Okay. They also, at a strategic level, have now got an approved economic procurement policy where green procurement is, a, is one of the five pillars of sustainable public procurement. And so it's very important that the work that I was doing was done within the context of strong institutional support, both within the Department of Human Settlements, but actually within the Western Cape government overall. Um, and I'm sure it's a, a similar story to the work that um, you are all doing in the various um, cities and countries that you're working in. Um, this is just another example um, of how it's strategically embedded in the um, annual performance plan around sustainable building technologies and wanting to do things differently or improve um, water and energy efficiency. Okay. So framing it in terms of uh, kind of sustainable public procurement means that we actually end up, if you see here, the environmental um, consideration under sustainable public procurement, um, what you see is that there are four areas of focus, climate change, water use, energy and waste. Okay, so these were the four kind of factors that we built in to the norms and standards. And also looking throughout the life cycle of a building. Um, how do we have all the opportunities um, throughout the construction process? Okay, and then also what we needed to do, which is very important, was framing the benefits of green procurement across the different scales of um, from beneficiary to the municipality to the province and the national government. Um, and this was really to make the case for why resource efficiency is important um, and framing it in terms of 
cost imperatives, uh, service delivery needs, and climate action. So as I said, this, is, this work that I'm going to talk to you about now uh, actually comes out of a project that we did in 2016-2017. And um, this is all the work, all the different outputs that were done. And there's some great case studies also um, that we will be sharing through the BEA platform um, to unpack the environmental and financial implications of green procurement in state subsidized housing. Um, but specifically this link, it's actually been made publicly available. There's what's called the Making Better Choices Green Procurement Guidelines, looking at what is possible within this very constrained bracket of uh, kind of building provision because uh, Green Star and um, other things, they're, they're very much applicable to a wide range of building typologies and including kind of high-end solutions. So this specifically focused on um, very low cost to no cost solutions just based on better design really, things such as passive design and that sort of thing, which are actually very easy to achieve in a building of this size. Um, the buildings are a bit range in size between 40 to 45 square meters for each unit. Okay, so this is the checklist that we also provided and that's now being used by some municipalities to try and kind of incorporate environmental considerations within their human settlements projects and it's available for you to also make use of um, if it would be helpful in any way um, just and if you want to chat about it just let me know. Very happy to chat through this because we tried to link an action to the implication in terms of socioeconomic benefit, financial benefit, and then the environmental outcome and when this project should happen, when this uh, intervention should happen in the project. Okay, so that's some of the resources that exist out of this project that the Western Cape government just wanted me to also share with all of you. And I think it's great that it has been made publicly available. So what we did in this project, which is actually the terms of reference was in a way informed by the recommendations coming out of that 2016-2017 report uh, project, was that we looked at four different areas um, in order to actually implement green procurement in state subsidized housing. It's the updated provincial norms and standards. We looked at the tender templates and functionality criteria um, and how you go about procuring service providers. Uh, guidelines for environmental management plans for contractors and then monitoring and evaluation. That's very much an internal process. But today we're going to focus on this element here, which is the updated provincial norms and standards. Okay, so we had two questions. Now we're really getting to the meat of it. We had two questions. The main question was to what extent can the norms and standards incorporate improved environmental considerations? And what additions or amendments to the norms and standards should be included to improve the environmental performance of top structures? So the norms and standards that currently exist are only for the top structures, the, uh, that which you see above the ground, well, including the foundations. But it doesn't include the provision of services. Um, so we, again, the scope was somewhat limited and we needed to work within that. Um, but these questions then kind of threw up a whole bunch of other questions um, around costs. So how do, we, how do we improve the environmental performance of top structures without actually needing more money to do so? We had to work within that 110,000 Rand that was allocated for each top structure. Um, and what are the implications of these? How do we go about measuring the interventions that we are um, proposing? And how do we, in order, once we've got the measurements, we can then evaluate which is better, a kind of a cost-benefit analysis. And then also, um, how do we evaluate different climates in the Western Cape? Specifically, our national legislation through the energy legislation identifies that the Western Cape has about th roughly three, three climates. So two things look different if you build a house in one town versus another town. And these are norms and standards, so we have to um, create one standard for the whole of the Western Cape despite climatic changes. Okay, so this is the methodology we then chose to use. So we reviewed the norm, the current norms and standards in light of the, that making better choices guidelines and checklist that I um, 
showed you. And that threw up a whole, a whole bunch of options when we looked at the no to low cost options that were available. Again, we're only looking at the top structure. So that limited us to kind of operational energy, um, operational water use, some level of embodied energy, um, recycled materials, um, and I'm trying to think of, and kind of a lot of passive design interventions, as I mentioned. And um, through all this work, I became familiar with the EDGE app and um, specifically the value it provided in terms of it was publicly accessible, so contractors could use it in the future and provincial government officials could use it in the future. Um, it's easy to use. Um, most people who have the basic understanding of construction, that sort of thing, can make use of it. Um, so it's not exclusionary. Um, it focuses on water, energy, and embodied materials, embodied energy in materials, which kind of aligns well to the focus areas that we wanted to look at. Um, because you obviously aren't able to do everything in terms of, um, especially if you want to keep it to no to low cost, um, that there is a measurable value provided. Um, so edge compliance is achieved when the 20% improvement on a base case. So you can say that something is better than the one option, better than another option. We can pursue certification if we want, um, and which may at times link to um, improved financing options, which is not as relevant in this in the BNG model, but actually could be relevant um, for others, uh, other kind of subsidy types. And then our ultimate goal became to have norms and standards that have specifications in them that are actually edge compliant. And this is where we also engaged with the IFC, specifically Lenore, who was unfortunately unable to join us, but thankfully Dennis is here. And so what we did was we identified two improved cases for each of the um, for each of the, the models. We had a single story 40 square meter, and then we had a 45 square meter uh, walk up or double story unit. So we looked at what passive design interventions we could include. Um, and what sort of benefit that gave us in terms of an improvement um, on the base case. And then also for the mechanical interventions. So I'll tell you what we looked at um, in a minute. Then we looked at the costing of interventions and compared them against the current subsidy breakdown. And then looked at what can we include in the norms and standards but given that we don't want to inc increase the costs at all. Um, and then we had to also look at opportunities for greening outside of what EDGE measures, um, such as the benefits of row housing, increased use of recycled aggregate, and the kind of now more common terminology of embodied water of materials. Okay, so that was the methodology that we used. And what we did is I first took the current norms and standards as they are, and I put them in EDGE to figure out where are we? Where do we need to make some changes? So what's really interesting is actually that the, the norms and standards, the current norms and standards actually do perform better than the base case, which is really great. Um, so in energy, we got about a 7.8% improvement on the base case. And um, this, you know, because we, we, our national regulations have limitations on window size um, before you have to go into some energy modeling and that sort of thing. We already have a minimum of insulation being installed. We only have CFL bulbs available, and there's natural ventilation in the design of the houses already because of cross ventilation. But unfortunately, it doesn't meet the edge standard. Okay, so we need to do some work there. Then with water, we actually do we actually perform quite well already given the current norms and standards, um, and that's it's about 17 and a half percent, but still doesn't reach the edge standard. So we needed to do some work there. And then what was very interesting, so, <laughs> and I did speak to the IFC about this because what you'll see is an incredible improvement in terms of um, materials efficiencies um, and embodied energy. And it actually results, the current norms and standards result in an improvement of 76.69%, which is actually huge. And um, the reason behind this was actually that because in South Africa we have incredibly low seismic activity. So we push the amount of material that we use for structural stability kind of really to the edge in a way. 
um, to, uh, yeah, um, about saying how we kind of already use as little material as possible as we need. Um, you know, we're using hollow concrete blocks and um, thin floor slabs and that sort of thing. So, so that's why there is such an, uh, an improvement. And um, but so ultimately we met the edge standard here, so we didn't need to make any improvement here. But of course, there's lots of room for improvement generally in terms of looking at sustainable building technologies, um, alternatives such as you know sandbags. Looking at those sort of options, um, and there are lots of innovations around that. But just in terms of edge and the kind of minimum standard, we didn't need to do any um, particular interventions here. Okay. Um, I mentioned for energy, we needed to do a little bit of work. And what we did is we actually reduced the window to floor ratio of the buildings from 15 to 10%. Um, and that made probably the most significant difference in terms of energy use. And then what we did is we also suggested that the roofs are painted white to bring in the cool roof concept. And then also to have the walls painted light colored, uh, kind of either pastel or uh, off white. Um, and this was um, this was generally accepted as, as kind of good practice. We engaged with both practitioners um, and suppliers to the department, as well as department officials and all municipalities in the Western Cape on this. And generally the surprise was, oh, so we don't need to get another 20,000 Rand to install a solar water heater. And I said, well, you, you can, um, because you'd get an even greater improved energy efficiency um, you push it up to about 28% with that, 28, 29%. But the absolute minimum standard, if you don't have any more money, you actually can still get a 20% improvement. So this was very eye-opening for many people. Um, so we were able to then meet the EDGE standard. The additional cost is there is expected to be actually no additional cost and possibly a cost saving because of the slightly reduced window sizes. And then with water, all we needed to do was um, change it from a 10 litre per minute shower, um, shower head to an 8 litre per minute um, shower head flow rate. So and the other option is to keep it at 10 litres and to drop the taps to 5 and 5. But that's, um, I mean, we've got, we've got quite good. We can get it down even, even further. But the most accepted measure was to reduce the um, flow rate of the shower head provided. Yes, so ultimately we were then able to meet the EDGE standard um, in the norms and standards and this was the, this is then what was put forward to the department. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. A lot of information about what we did, <laughs> um, but I hope that it's been able to provide some practical, uh, an, an overview of how practically how we actually made use of EDGE for what was actually a policy intervention in the end, in the norms and standards. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, hi, Rebecca Dirac here. Hi. Uh, that's a really good presentation. Uh, just would like to know, uh, so the, the current uh, social housing which is being constructed in this Western Cape uh, area, are they following these norms and uh, and do they have any plans to also apply for edge certification? Sure. So this is for the breaking new ground model. So um, it's for people who earn between naught and three and a half thousand rand a month. Um, so social housing is then for people who earn between five thousand and twenty thousand rand a month. So this, um, just as a clarification, so, but this hasn't yet been, um, it's still in the process of being adopted by the Western Cape government. I only just finished this project actually last month. <laughs> so, um, but we work very closely with the person who's the custodian of the norms and standards. So I do have, uh, I do quite strongly believe that, that it will be adopted. Fantastic. Uh, um, yeah. The edge certification, at the moment, it's basically, um, it's, it's an alternative measure that a, a contractor could take up, but the, currently the cost is of edge certification and the scale of it that would be required is still being discussed. And this is what I'm trying to also facilitate between the Western Cape government and the IFC, is to come to some sort of agreement 
around this um, because okay. it would be great to have certification. But unfortunately, certification often makes more sense in higher income brackets um, at times. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, it's Paul here. Um, Hello. Yeah, I've, I've got a question about it. So, when they do start building to this standard, will they be, are there plans to do any monitoring of the uh, performance in use um, up to the new standard or to see how it compares with the designs? Yes, so so the way the way Edge works is that you can't get the Edge certification unless it's like an as built um, it's actually been built. So the the performance, to be honest, that's what the monitoring evaluation aspect that I mentioned, that kind of fourth element of the project was all about because they actually sit on a lot of information and they're not yet um, making use of it, analyze mm. are they actually having the benefit that they, they hope in terms of uh, resource efficiency. It's quite a big undertaking because they don't actually construct these buildings themselves. It's all it's all contractors. But it's mm. something I do believe can definitely be embedded within the management processes. Um, so we put forward the proposed um, monitoring and evaluation system, but I think I do believe that there would need to be further training, upskill, kind of the building control guys also be looking at this. Um, but it's not fast step because we already they have to implement the efficiency uh, national standard and they have to be upskilled in that too. Mm, okay. So th this would be like a couple of years from now when they do it if it happens. Yeah. Yes, I think so. But the next step I think is definitely to find a project where they can almost like draw you know draw a ring around it and say we're actually going to monitor this with some okay. additional effort. Um and then as a pilot in a way, but I'd prefer not to see it as a pilot. That it doesn't, I don't want there to be a standalone. You know, it needs to be embedded in the whole decision-making process. Okay, brilliant, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, hi, Rebecca, Adhiraj again. Uh, just quickly on the, on the materials front, uh, as you have indicated the, the, the usual construction code, the project is, the projects are able to achieve 80% efficiency so i think the, that sh that should become the new baseline for the edge uh, software so uh, what are your views on this uh, did you have any communication with the ifc on this yes i did speak to them actually i, I was I even able to speak to the developer of edge facilitated by um the no which is which a great um, kind of privilege to be able to speak to them and um what he said was that um, so the 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 energy component and the water component are nationalized. So the base case has been brought down to the national level and is based on the national standards. The embodied energy is actually a global standard still. And so they were getting, they were actually getting um, quite a few issues about people not being able to meet the embodied energy requirements. Um, because they were too strict, and so they created a um, a global a global standard that uh, so even if you're in you know um, Nepal with a lot of uh, you know a lot of seismic activity, it would still make sense. It was still you'd still end up with a structurally safe edge certified building. So I did say that to them. It does need further investigation. To be honest, um, I, I think it would be within a further iteration of of edge, but the other thing is that uh, the norms and stand. It's a difficult question for me to answer on behalf of IFC. I did have a discussion. Yeah, I it. understand, but that's yeah. an interesting um, insight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I would also want to, I mean, add that at the moment we are actually updating the baseline for edge. So mm. um, yes. it's, it will be it will be great to have such feedbacks from you. So if, if you have any of such feedback, you just send it to edge at ifc.org, edge at ifc.org. We, we are taking all of this feedback and mm. then we will update the baseline. But then when it comes to the embodied energy and materials, um, Elizabeth is on the line and she will bear with us. I mean, in Kenya, we had um, opposite 
over there where projects were not able to meet the material uh, criteria because, I mean, they, they were all below 20%. So we had to look at the situation again. Um, mm. What we realized was there was um, a, a particular material that they were using in their buildings, uh, stone, which wasn't quickly the, I mean, indicated in our software. So we, we had to do a reassessment, look at the research work that the KGB has did to actually indicate the um, energy efficiency for that material. And we, and we did the abyss for them. So yes, um, edge, edge is not very rigid. We rely so much on the feedback that we get from the users on the field. And then um, once it makes sense and we're able to justify it, we always then update it.